You're listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Welcome to Cinema D, a film discussion and review podcast on BQN. We're here to showcase the films you probably missed but should definitely check out. From independent and obscure to art house and absurd, each episode we'll gather, well, perhaps a cocktail in hand to discuss it all. I'm your host, Mark, and with me today are the lovely Matt Jennings, as usual, and associate producer, Miss Amy Nelson, is back joining us this week. So welcome, guys. Well, hi. Thanks for Hello. having me back. So good to have you back. We got Davey scoping out things, making sure we're still going, and now you're here, and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're getting all your associate (laughs) producers on board. Love it, love it. Hi, Matt. How are you? I am good. I am good. I'm excited to talk about this film. Well, what's everybody drinking this week? Well, I did have time to make myself a little cocktail, and as per usual... I've got a lovely cranberry is my mixer of choice with some Mm. lime and some peach whiskey and a little orange liqueur. Oh, it looks beautiful. God, it looks gorgeous and it sounds delicious. Thank you. I am drinking. What is this called? Let me grab the bottle. Hold on. Mike's extra harder, harder. (laughs) No. From 7-Eleven. But I guarantee you when that comes out, I'm buying it. I'll be the first one in line. No, this is, uh, what is this called? This is called San Antonio. It's pineapple papaya. That's the flavor of this sweet wine. Oh. Oh, Wow. A sweet wine. Okay, nice. Mm. But I like all my drink sugary. What can I say? Yes. You like a little sugar in your tank. I do. I do. Who and doesn't? Mark, what are you uh, enjoying there? I have um, a very scrumptious lemon drop martini, mm. but in uh, like a ball uh, canning glass. It looks like yeah. a mason jar. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> it is the same thing, but yet called, you guys just call them totally different things. That was funny. <laughs> Well, you guys, have you watched anything lately? I mean, in the past few weeks, <laughs> what you seen? What you been? What you putting putting in your eye holes? <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Okay, okay. So, I saw a movie called Monkey Man. Um, oh, I heard about it. Was it good? Oh, oh my god! Oh my god! It was so good. This movie now, was what's so the good. Premise? I'm not going to do it justice, but it's basically, it's like a, it's a revenge story. It's a story about this guy that lived in poverty. He is overcoming poverty. Like, I guess in his state of poverty, he was like a prize fighter, more or less. Like he was fighting to make, uh, to make money. But there's like this whole, this whole other past that's tied, tied behind it. I think to say it's just a revenge story doesn't do it justice. I'm, I encourage people to look up the synopsis. There's some great fight scenes in it. I think that uh, Dev Patel also did his own stunts, or some of his hmm. own stunts. Ooh. Um, Jordan Peele produced it. I was just, I was inspired. I just encourage people to watch it. It was so good. What about you, Mark? So I finally watched Dune 2. Oh. Uh, I liked it. It's just Dune 1 was kind of a long film. Dune 2 was kind of a really long film. And together, they're like three films. Yeah. So I feel like it might have been better if they were chopped into three films for the first book, right? Right. Mm -hmm. That way it could have been more of a bite-sized film. uh, Because putting on either of the films, you got to give yourself an evening, you know, because it's a long, long haul. I heard in the lead up that it was going to be much more action adventure heavy and stunts and all the little action 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 compared to the first one and i got into it and i watched it and i mean mind you i'm not an action adventure guy that's not my thing i was like oh i like the pacing of the first one so blah 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 no it was like the same as the first one i i didn't feel like it had much more action than the first one it was still 
pretty much like similar pacing. I appreciate that they didn't do the whole uh, the modern thing with the uh, the stunts when they're doing karate and whatever, and they're jumping all over the walls and climbing on the ceiling. Like that stuff's bullshit. Like I just I hate it when I see it in films. Like that doesn't happen unless it's it in the Matrix. Happen. Unless it's in it the defies, Matrix. It defies the laws of physics. Yeah, yeah, come to do it. It defies the laws of physics. <laughs> um, but no, a little Star Trek. But no, it, you know, this actually showed fight scenes of people actually fighting and training and doing and doing fight choreography, and that I loved. And also Austin Butler's little like what is it, evil space twink? What did I tell you, Matt? That um, I, I think I would have let him what rough fuck me or something like that. I, I think that's how I. I, I do believe yeah. that that is that is indeed what you what you had said. Um, yeah. I stand by my statement. Um, fuck, it's worth it. The price of admission to see him standing there, like in just like a loincloth, getting paint rubbed on him. I was like, oh. oh, oh. Well, I mean, I felt something in my nether region. Well, we've we've <laughs> talked about it, but I mean, like you know, I I still like Austin Butler. Obviously, was gorgeous, but I still stand by like Sting in '80s Dune was still like <laughs> no, the no, sexiest no, no. thing I've ever seen. Amy, have you seen oh. uh, '80s Dune? Yes, I have. Do you remember Sting? In, yes. I in the speedo. Wow. I stand behind Sting in the in the speedo in '80s Dune. That is still incredibly sexy and one of the sexiest things I've ever seen. He gave Timothy Chalamet his underwear. Really? <laughs> he wore that. No, though. he didn't. Look it That's up. That's awesome. Look it up. No. Yes, he did. Oh, my God. That's cool. <laughs> now I like I the scene even it. more. <laughs> oh, my God. Or Austin oh. Butler, rather, or something. I don't know. Somebody got his underwear. God, I'll whatever. have to look. God, and to think that Patrick, <laughs> Patrick Stewart had no idea who, who he was either. Right? Had no idea who Sting was uh, when they were filming Dune. I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Amy, you watched anything? Um, I'm watching Star Trek right now, and I just have to say, today's episode, we're recording this on Thursday, and it's um, Discovery Season 5, Episode 6, Aragon. Oh, oh Amy, seen. we're pre- we're pretending it's June. Oh, yeah, we're pretending it's June. Yeah, yeah. Well, She's re-watching an episode that originally <laughs> aired in May. I, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it oh, yet. Oh, I'm just going to say I loved this week's episode like okay love love the pacing was perfect everything moved along the story was great every plot line oh just the pieces are falling into place yeah yeah and it didn't feel rushed that's what i loved about it too it's nice i mean i'll say this little tidbit with the theme that they're exploring in this season of of discovery and with some things that I've been going through personally in my life, it all seems very serendipitous to be watching this season right now. So I appreciate it very much. Well, moving on to the film. This week, ladies and gentlemen, if you couldn't tell from the headline that you clicked on for the episode, we are covering my own private Idaho. River Phoenix and Keanu Reeves star in this haunting tale from Gus Van Sant about two young street hustlers, Mike Waters, a sensitive narcoleptic who dreams of the mother who abandoned him, and Scott Favre, the wayward son of the mayor of Portland, Oregon, and the object of Mike's desire. Navigating a volatile world of junkies, thieves, and johns, Mike takes Scott on a quest along the grungy streets and open highways of the Pacific Northwest in search of an elusive place called home. Visually dazzling and thematically groundbreaking, My Own Private Idaho is a deeply moving look at unrequited love and life on society's margins. Mm -hmm. So I got to tell you, um, this is one of those finds. I keep bringing this up. I mean, this is the reason for the pod, and that's why I'm going to keep bringing it up. But when I was a kid, you know, I didn't have a lot of friends, and I didn't know anybody that felt the same way that I did. My worldview of anything related to queerness I had to discover through the independent, small independent film section at my local like blockbuster or movie rental place. And I saw, I was like, I'm going to check this out. And uh, I put it on and 
really the campfire scene. I mean, I love I love the whole movie, but in that one scene, it spoke to the little little boy that was alone in the world and didn't think that he was right. He didn't feel like the love or the feelings that he had, he was allowed to have. And in that moment, he saw a friendship, he saw a love, he saw two people, their their closeness. And maybe, just maybe, like a glimmer of hope that someday he would be able to be loved and accepted by someone else in the world for who he was. And that's what this movie did for me at its core. Mm. But that's me in my soapbox. Um, I would like to know what interested you about seeing this film? Okay, so I'm not going to lie. I saw the picture of Keanu Reeves in the collar and it did things to me. So visually, it was like, <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I get to, I get to see that. Um, but, you know, on a serious note, I had never heard of the film. I had never heard of the film until you brought it up, Mark. I saw the trailer and became even more curious i think it was a very curious just about how how the queer element was going to be handled in the film mm. it didn't look like it was going to be a heavy-handed soapbox type of film if that if that makes sense it just it looked as if what i was going to watch was going to be a very thoughtful piece with the themes layered throughout kind of making you work to to find it and making you work to um making you work to listen and to see it um, Do you feel like that's what you got? Definitely. And more. And more. And I'll, I'll talk about that, you know, as we go later on today. But those are the first reasons why I wanted to see it. And, again, you know, Keanu in a collar. Who knew? Who knew? He looks good in a collar. Who knew? Oh, when he was standing in front of his father in, like, that bondage gear? Oh, my oh, yeah. God. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. So, I watched this because Mark invited me to. Uh, we go back and forth on movies that we share, and it's usually me saying, Mark, what the heck am I watching? Um, <laughs> and this is truly what happened with this movie. So I'm just going to be honest with you listeners. Um, I watched it for that reason. I wanted to come and you know learn more about my best friend, Mark. So I'm here. I have watched the movie. I obviously missed everything because just <laughs> hearing, like reading the synopsis, I'm like, that synopsis was 10 times better than the movie itself. So I obviously have missed some things and I'm very interested to hear these themes come through because I'm starting to see what you're saying about this family it was so disconnected for me. And you're right, Mark, you've got to work for this movie. This is not anything that's going to be handed to you on a silver platter. So I'm very excited for this discussion. Well, the story of my own private Idaho is at its core, a family story, whether it's Scott rejecting his strict upbringing and going against his father's wishes, finding a new father figure in the Fagan esque Bob, or Mike search for a family on his own, looking at his looking for his estranged mother, the truth about his brother slash father, or finding a family in the arms of his best friend Scott. In this section, we'll discuss the themes of family that you related to the most or found the most compelling. Yeah, this family thing, again, I'm just being honest, I, I totally missed it. But now that you're pointing it out, because you do get constantly Mike thinking about his mother and like his upbringing, and then that is mirrored in Scott sort of running away from his upbringing. Mm -hmm. So I like, now that I recognize it, I like that contrast, but yet still how they come together even though they are coming mm. from two different worlds. I guess found families, mm. I think something that's very heavily discussed or shown in this movie, um, especially with Mike, who the whole time basically does not have a family. He finds that family with his fellow, for lack of better words, sex workers. Were they all, were they all given names? I, uh, I think their names are tossed around when they're at the diner. 
a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think he finds, you know, family with his fellow sex workers, with Bob, with Keanu Reeves' character. I think there's, you know, there's family there uh, with, you know, the way probably Keanu Reeves the most. Mm-hmm. You know, he's mm-hmm. literally every time that he has, I guess, for lack of better words, an episode with his narcolepsy, Keanu Reeves is literally picking him up and carrying him or taking him to a location getting in the cab, making sure he's there in the morning in the cab when he wakes up. There's nothing more about the queer experience than that. If you grow up queer in America, like that is the first thing that you discover is that there's this whole family of people that are going to be there for you. And that's one of the first things you learn. And that's what's another cool feature of this film is that that's built into the DNA of just representing that aspect of the queer experience. And I've got to say, you know, um, just personally for me, from, you know, some of my experiences, you know, when I was slowly but surely coming out of the closet, you know, one of the places that really helped me to uh, be more comfortable with who I was and really understand more about my community was uh, the LGBTQ resource center that was on campus Mm -hmm. at my college. And even then, my friend Emerson, who still didn't know much about the queer community, but just wanted to hang out with me sometimes in between classes in college, he would call me up, where are you at? I'm like, oh, you know, we would call it the ligabit. That's what we would say. <laughs> he said, you have the ligabit? Like, yeah, he's like, all right, I'll meet you over there. He would hang out in there sometimes in between classes while I was out of class. So, you know, that was that found family element. It's, you know, it's so very real for the queer community. And last thing that I'll say is that when, at least for me and other friends, if we're trying to find out if someone is gay or if they're queer, the thing is we'll lean over to the person. Hey, are, are they family? Is that person family? Mm. Like, oh, I don't know. They might be a distant cousin. Oh, oh, OK. OK. <laughs> <laughs> So a question for you with this family discussion, like what made Keanu Reeves character, is it Mike or no, Scott, what made him care for Mike so much? You know, my understanding of the character is that he has lived this sheltered upbringing, you know, and been around these phony materialistic people his whole life. Like he had a maid, Mm -hmm. you know, and he probably got shuffled from boarding school to boarding school and and whatnot. And he kept meeting people that were, I guess, disingenuous uh, or only thought about themselves. And here he's meeting this person that, that wants nothing of him but his friendship. And he connects to that. He's like, oh, finally, finally, there's somebody in my Mm -hmm. life that wants me for me and not what they can get from me. Even his father, you know, parades him around like a status symbol, you know, when he's younger, which causes him to rebel the way that he Mm -hmm. does. And it also causes him to wear a collar. Yeah. I mean, talk, talk about being rebellious. Have you guys, have either of you ever done something like, a little rebellious that might have, you know, got under the nerves of your your parents. Yes, but it was a very safe rebellious. You didn't come home wearing a dog collar. <laughs> no, like I would come home like if midnight was my curfew, I'd come home at like five past. Oh, Amy, you're so bad. I know. <laughs> I mean, he didn't know the pressure. <laughs> Gosh, I can't think of anything now. The only thing that I can think of is I used to I used to sag my pants. Ooh. And that was hush, Mark. Hush. I see that face and I see the words ready to come out. Hush. Listeners, you can't see Mark right now, but he's beat red. Um I used to I used to sag my pants and then I know that my parents hated it and I remember my stepdad and my mom, they started doing it. And I was that like, makes it uncool. I was like, oh, guys, stop. Why are you doing that? Like, well, you're doing it. And then I started to wear my pants around my waist after that. That was smart. That was incredibly clever. That was an incredibly clever teaching tool. Yeah. For me, the obviously, the story of Scott and Mike in their, their found family with each other, um, I found compelling. But... There was also this 
I don't know. I've talked to Amy a little bit about like the twi- the Oliver Twist connections with this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And I found that compelling also because I, you know, I had read that story when I was a kid as well. And I saw the threads of that in this film of, you know, these kids that didn't have homes, right? And so they befriended this sort of vagabond character, this the Fagin character that uh, taught them how to um, pickpocket and whatnot. But together they were like a band of thieves and they were a family and they did look out for one another. And there was something about, you know, I grew up, you know, strict Catholic or whatever, where I always felt like, the bad seed, the bad apple. And so I saw these other people that were like, you know, castaways from their family in this and how they found each other. And there was something about that sort of brotherhood that I guess I maybe not, you know, longed for is a strange thing to say about pickpockets, but just, you know, the the camaraderie and the community that they had with each other uh, was something that I found um, intriguing. Yeah, I can see that, but they just weren't really there for each other, I felt. Or was it that Mike and Scott kept moving around? Because, like, when things got serious, those guys were high as a kite and not doing nothing. Well, they had their own little yeah squad. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> the, the Mike and Scott squad. But, you know, and that's a lot of friend groups, too, you know. You get a group of like six, eight, ten friends together if you have that many, if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. But within that, there's a little like, okay, these two are closer, these two are closer. Right. They all just kind of hang out because they were all involved in band or whatever. The heck it is. And I think from what I, what I observed from Mike and Scott and Bob in that relationship was that I think that there is an element of the parental again bringing up the enjoyment of rebelling a little bit. And I think especially for Keanu Reeves' character, I think he enjoys jabbing Bob. Like, I just think that that's... Mm. I think that's their relationship throughout most of the movie. It's just him always, like, poking him and jabbing him and calling him out on things. I never quite saw it as a as a biting, vicious nature. It was playful. Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah, I saw it more of a playful nature, not a vicious nature. But I think Scott and Mike, they kind of, like, that's just their, that's their thing that they do. But I, I saw it as like a, a playful, a playful nature, not not so much um, biting or uh, vicious. And I think he could get away with it too because he has had the education hmm. outside of that, hmm. and he didn't look at Bob in the same way that the other kids did because it, essentially, like he knew at some point he could get out of being homeless. Yeah, yeah there was. That's true. Yeah. So he his was a choice while everyone else. Didn't really have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, besides being a story of family, Idaho is also a love story. Whether it's a one night stand, tricks looking for love through sex with our film's heroes, Mike's unrequited love with his best friend Scott, or Scott's Italian lover we meet later in the film, the lone figure who was able to exist in both of his worlds, Hustler and Mayor's son. Which one of these love stories did you connect with the most or find the most compelling? So for me, and I I didn't want to, I didn't want to bring up the campfire scene just yet. I really wanted to wait and talk about it later. But I have to say so much love to, to River Phoenix, right? That's his name. Mm -hmm. Uh, So much love to River Phoenix for playing that scene so, so honestly. So I identified with, you know, that story or that, that unrequited love the most, I think, especially, you know, when you are coming out of the closet and becoming more and more aware of your emotions. I don't know if this is every queer person's story, but for me, I had a tendency to attach myself to people that were not available (laughs) uh, or emotionally available (laughs) in certain ways. I mean, I think we all have a tendency to still do that. But I think back then it was just, it was very clear that, you know, this person was not going to be interested or this person was not queer. This person, you know, was not, Mm -hmm. you know, interested in having any kind of relationship with me. But I think there is something to be said about that moment at the campfire and that confession of love. And I'm just, I'm talking about the acting choices. I can't help it down to just the, the physical choice that river Phoenix uh, made to just 
huddle himself and kind of like cover himself up and hold himself while he's telling uh, Keanu Reeves' character that he loves him because it is so vulnerable. And sometimes to be vulnerable is incredibly painful because you're literally, in, you're uh, not literally, but you are opening yourself up. And so to see him be uncomfortable, to see him admit that he loves this person and to see the struggle in admitting that to him and maybe to himself was beautiful to watch and so honest okay i'm done listening to you talk about the campfire scene i couldn't help but think of the stark differences between that scene in my own private idaho and the scenes the passionate scenes in brokeback mountain mind you brokeback mountain pushed the boundaries quite a bit when that movie came out and was a lot more mainstream. It was shown in a lot more theaters, what have you. But when I think about the love in Brokeback Mountain and the love in Idaho, I feel like the queer experience is more closely represented in Idaho than in Brokeback. And Brokeback, at its core, is a queer movie. Idaho is, but I would say it's not as much at the forefront as it is with Brokeback Mountain but I feel more aligned with it in its honesty and its rawness with Idaho than I do in Brokeback Mountain, which seems a little bit more sensationalized. Anyway, that's my opinion. Yeah, I I think it's just, it's different. I mean, these are different characters too. Um, Yeah. You know, Brokeback Mountain is very, um, you are dealing with people that are very, I mean, masculine, but at the same time, they on some level, they haven't admitted to themselves that they feel this way yeah. at all. Except for, like, maybe maybe Jake Gyllenhaal's character, because I was like, okay, so you're just, like, ready to, like, to take it right now? Okay, like, you've had some experiences. Whereas, you know, in my own private Idaho, we are around male sex workers, we're around... There is queerness kind of surrounding them, so they've kind of lived in it in mm-hmm. some kind of way. So it's in the atmosphere, whereas in Brokeback Mountain, it really is just the two of them. Um, yeah. So it's, I, th- I think it's just different worlds, different characters, different circumstances. I just, I guess what I'm just trying to say is that I felt more connected to it uh, and that it aligned more with my story than Brokeback Mountain did. Yeah. But the one scene I think they did right in Brokeback was the, um, towards the end when he, he goes back and finds the jacket hung up in the closet. And uh, realized that the jacket was important. That that part I felt like got it in the got it right in the same way this movie did with the campfire, as telling what the queer experience is. It's that emotional connection you have, that vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. So with that campfire scene, is it unrequited love? Because Scott doesn't feel the same way, right? Scott does love him as a friend, yeah. right. but that's not the same way. Goes. Yeah. Yeah. What I loved about that was that you, that their friendship remained um, because so many mm, times yes. you hear, oh, well, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to ruin our friendship. Well, if they're truly your friend, then thank you for being honest with me yes. and let's continue to be friends. I'm sorry. I don't have these emotions and, are you mature enough to continue now that this is in the air? And they yeah. both were. They both were very mature, way more than like what we saw with Bob's gang of hoodlums, mm. you know? So yeah. that, again, that campfire scene solidified their maturity and their relationship and this unrequited love and friendship and, and chosen family all so beautifully. Yeah. And, you know, the response that, that Keanu Reeves' character has after this major confession where he just says, come here, you know, yeah. and he just yeah. brings him in and he just holds him and he hugs him. Oh, my God. I could yeah. cry. Uh, Every time I see that scene, it just brings up all the it's, feels. Uh, yeah. And I think as well, at that that age, because they're, well, how old are they? Are they they're supposed to be in their 20s. They're supposed to be like... Well, right? they're supposed—they're in their twenties. They're supposed to be teenagers because they're supposed to. He's still 
in high school, like supposedly Keanu Reeves. Oh, right. I thought they were like going to college. That's what I thought, but I. But I mean, yeah. like it's I guess age. it's more or less that age. Yeah, seventeen to twenty. Late teens, I think, in the developmental stages, uh, especially with. Uh, River Phoenix's character, who is suffering from a certain kind of trauma, to have this other kind of love kind of reinforced, I think was also like very important. Talking about River Phoenix's character, Mike, and his upbringing, you know, he kept getting the, all these stories about what happened to his dad, but really the truth was that his father was his brother, and that his family was a family of incest you know his mother was molesting the kids so that's its own kind of trauma its own can of worms i think amy didn't realize that the mother was abusing the children yes the the mother had at least slept with his older brother wow of which he was the product of oh yeah did not catch that at all is that also an element that's in one of the Shakespearean pieces as well? I mean, it's in, it is in, it, it is seems, in Shakespeare. It seems like Shakespeare. But yeah. I, because I haven't, I've only seen the Henrys once, yeah. and that was in college, so I don't remember the, you know, I don't remember the story, and I haven't read them, so. He keeps getting all these stories from his brother about, oh, your father was this, or your father was that, and blah, 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 blah. And he's like, no, you're my father. You're my real dad. You know, and he's like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. So his his whole upbringing, he just had this warped sense of what love was, what family yeah. was. I mean, talk about a broken home. It doesn't get any more broken than that. Speaking of broken homes, um, actually, moving on to the next topic. You know, just for the listeners, I had actually looked up a, a bunch of statistics. I'm not going to throw them out here uh, about the number of LGBTQI plus youths that end up um, on the street because they're kicked out by their families. But I will say that um, the numbers from the 90s that I got and the numbers today didn't appear to have that much of a significant drop, which was uh, quite disappointing. Um, I you know, encourage everybody to look it up for yourselves, but it was very disappointing to find that out, as well as the number of um, teen suicides, uh, especially within the LGBT uh, community. Um, when you're on the street and fending for yourself often is the case with young people, they get exploited. And, uh, as was the case with our heroes in this story, uh, Scott and Mike were two street hustlers doing what they could to survive. At the time this film was made, we were coming out of the Reagan era AIDS epidemic and the Christian rights war on sexual deviancy as they saw it. Uh, director Gus Van Sant plucked the two most up-and-coming male stars of the time to star in this film centered on homeless male prostitutes, which could have been a career suicide in the wrong hands. Uh, In this section, I'd like to discuss the importance of giving a voice and a face to often overlooked and misjudged people in society. How well do you think this film does in humanizing these characters and how important is it for filmmakers to continue to tell these types of stories? It's like what I was saying, like, when I was talking about Monkey Man earlier, how there was a queer element in that movie and how, you know, there was a purpose to it. It's not like we were there just to be there. And I think, you know, obviously with this movie, with it being in the in the forefront of the story, it's the same thing where there's a subtlety to it that is very humanizing at the same time. There's an element of joy as well between, you know, the family, the found family that we have. There's an element of joy. Can you talk about that a little bit? The, what do you mean? The element that? of joy. Um, I just mean uh, the element of joy with uh, with Bob and with everybody else and with the gang when Bob is telling the stories. And I mean, even though, you know, he is lying to them and he's embellishing, he's embellishing the stories a lot. But I don't know. I think that there's something... What you're saying is they didn't film it in a way which made these characters look demonized. I mean, right, right. It was just humanizing, and it was just mm-hmm. natural. Uh, these people were just who they were. This was the world that we were in, and there was no uh, 
There was no heavy-handed explanation. There was no... Judgment? There was no judgment. There was no major statement to be made in a way that it was like, look at this. It was more like the statement was made was by just watching these people. The characters just happened to be homeless. They just happened to be street hustlers. But that wasn't the story right. that was being told. Right. Like, this just happened to be... It kind of just happened to be the scenario that they were in. I mean, I I think I kind of just accepted that this is the world where they were living in, and I was like, okay, so this is the this is the atmosphere, this is what we're in, okay. And I mean, I think for me, just watching it, the love story between Keanu and River Phoenix's characters, for me, a big chunk of that movie is just him carrying him and holding him when he has an episode, and coming in and checking in and saying, hey. Hey, you all right? Here we are. We're here at this location. We're here at this thing. T- to me, that's that's the strength of the of the movie is the simplicity in the storytelling, and making a major statement with the simplicity. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, I'm glad you ended it that way because yes, this is a major statement piece, and I'm sorry that I'm not watching it in 1991 when it came out. Um, but looking at it with rose-colored glasses and hindsight's 2020, this piece is very important. So 91, you're coming off of the 80s. Everything was great in the 80s. We covered up. We had no sins. Everything was nice. We didn't talk about closed doors. We were Mm. just boomers, Mm. were having their kids, everyone was in neighborhoods, and suburbia was well and alive in America. And to have a movie dedicated to, as you've said, the fringe of society, this was not in our vision at all. We were not talking about the disenfranchised. We weren't talking about those on the outskirts of financial, of family stability, of mental stability. Those were all, let's just sweep it under the rug. That's what the 80s was. So now we're 91 where it's like things have been festering for a decade and they've got to get out. And I feel like this movie really exposes this movement of LGBTQ rights, teenage homelessness, like all of this that we need, we are responsible for. It's not like, oh, that's happening over there. And Mark, if you don't mind, I'd like to tie in that trivia with River Phoenix because I didn't make the connection. I remember Uh, Because 1991 was the year I graduated high school. Thank you very much. I'm old. Where were you in 91? Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing about this actor, River Phoenix, and like how he was ruining his life and that it was because of some movie. And I was like, what? I, I didn't investigate. I didn't care. You know, that was Hollywood. This was some famous actor getting Mm. in it. But I think you've got in your trivia, like, River Phoenix threw himself into this role and really like, and I remember, okay, so I'm just going to read it. So yeah, he threw himself dangerously into the character. Not only did Phoenix interview real hustlers, but according to friends, he experimented with hard drugs and even dabbled in same, same sex shenanigans. He hung out with hustlers on the streets of Portland, learning the, uh, you know, tricks of the trade. Uh, Reeves, Keanu Reeves, also did similar research, though as not ex- as extensively. Um, he began to dress and groom himself like a grungy street kid to the point where he was turned away from a nightclub because the bouncer thought he was a bum. Now that I remember. And I was like, mm. what is this actor doing? Like, I didn't understand it. So I am now I'm feeling a little bad that I didn't recognize this important message that was being told about society where I was living. You brought up a really good point, Amy, about middle America and thinking that, um, you know, these problems were elsewhere. These people were elsewhere, that gay people only existed sort of in the Mm -hmm. cities, that prostitution only happened in the cities 
and whatnot. And we here we have our main characters. They're traversing across the Midwest through Idaho and Nebraska and Oklahoma and, you know, all of these places where, you know, like the heartland and, you know, they exist there too. You know, I have to say coming from, I mean, I was, I was born in 87, so I didn't know about like the Reagan era, Reaganomics, yeah. all of the, I didn't know about that stuff until much later on, mm-hmm. much later on. One of my friends, David, he is gay and he was just very much, you know, into the nightlife scene uh, in the 70s and in the 80s. You know, I've David is a very loving person and I have never seen him have disdain or talk negatively about anybody until I saw him talk about Ronald Reagan. And it was it was shocking. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I mean, like, under, you know, justified justified and understandable but it you know i didn't quite get the impact until i watched him talk about the things that he witnessed and things that he experienced and that's when it really started to land for me so uh i'm gonna go on a a personal side tangent that i probably shouldn't on this podcast but i I feel like i will um somebody will connect with it you know i was at a, a place in my life on numerous occasions where i uh did not have money uh, I traversed across the United States throughout my 20s uh, into my early 30s. Uh, I would move around like every six months or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, it wasn't exactly great uh, financial uh, planning on my part, but um, it did teach me a lot about a life and, and who I was and who I wanted to be, the type of person. Uh, I sat outside of grocery stores before looking for a handout. Um, I've been there. And so when I think about the characters in this that I can align with, I can align with a lot of them. And so the movie really speaks to me. And I hope that, you know, if there's somebody out here like listening to this podcast and, you know, they're in a place of like, you know, I can barely afford food and I have to do X, Y, or Z, have an OnlyFans, whatever. The rest of the world might have their opinion about you but the most important one you have is your own of yourself and um and there are people out there that love you and you are worthy of love very well said yeah well said thank you thank you for for sharing sharing. well guys uh (laughs) i've been busy working on my house okay (laughs) i think they've been busy so uh i haven't had time to uh give an extensive list for director's cut this week uh, I love to throw in a bunch of scenes. This time we have one, but you know, listeners, we got the most important one. And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. So uh, we do have the campfire scene here. So if you haven't seen the film, and we've been talking about this scene through its entirety, you're not going to hear it better than the way it's going to be acted out today. Yes. <laughs> so who is going to be Mike and who is going to be Scott? And it's going to be one of you two, This because this needs to be done between you two. I, I am definitely uh, going to be okay. Mike. And Matt Jennings, award-winning oh, actor. Oh, God. Stop. With the accolades Stop. in his own, his own <laughs> films. The the writer, director, producer, editor of a blurred story himself, Matt Jennings, is going to be my Scott favor because he doesn't have a choice. I will be your Scott. <laughs> Action. Getting away from everything feels good. Yeah, it does. You know, when I left home, the maid asked me you know, where I was going. I said, wherever. Whatever. Have a nice day. Yeah. You had a maid? Yeah. It, if I hadn't normal family and a good upbringing, then I will, I, I would have been a well-adjusted person. It depends what you call normal. Yeah, it does. Well, you know, normal, like, like a mom and a dad and a dog and, and shit like that. Normal. Normal. So you didn't have a normal dog? No, I, I didn't have a dog. You didn't have a dad? Didn't, didn't have a dog or or, or a normal dad, anyway. That, that's all right. I, 
I don't feel sorry for myself. I mean, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, well adjusted. It's a normal dad. I don't know. I, I'd like, I'd like to talk to you. I'm, I mean, I'd really like to talk with you. We're, we're talking right now, but you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't feel like I could be, I don't feel like I could be close to you. I mean, we're close. Right now we're close, like, but, I mean, you know. Uh, how close? I mean. I, I don't, whatever. What? What do I mean to you? What do you mean to me? Mike, you're my best friend. I, I know, man. I, and I know. I know you're my best friend. We're good friends. And it's good to be, you know, good friends. That's a good thing. So? So I just, that's okay. We can be friends. I only have sex with a guy for money. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, and two guys can't love each other. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, I could love someone even if, you know, I wasn't getting paid for it. I, I love you, and you don't pay me. Mike. I really want to kiss you, man. Good, good night, man. I, I love you, though. And know that. I, I do love you. Alright. Come here, Mike. It's like... Come on, just, just go to sleep. Come on. Cut. And the Lawrence Olivier Award goes to... <laughs> Wow. Touching. Oh. There's a lot of good dialogue in that movie. I hope that our listeners enjoy checking it's it out. So good. Um it's but yeah, that scene. <laughs> Even Gus Van Sant, who is an openly gay filmmaker, was concerned about including it in the film and had not written it that way. It was just sort of going to be the two guys sort of having a conversation around the fire. And this whole thing was River's idea, and he wrote it and held on to it like on a little slip of paper until the day of didn't let anybody know aside from the director um, so yeah kudos because that's it was wow. beautiful it was beautifully written it was just it was well done i mean keanu who i guess you know didn't know on the until like you said until the day of right that he was gonna that those that was the text and that was you know what it was going to be mm -hmm. said just responding yeah. just being open and just responding it's very honest that scene was so honest I could go on and on, but beautiful. <laughs> well, guys, we have reached the rewrites portion. Uh, so if there is something about this film that you could change, uh, what would it be and how? I know. Amy's already told me she would make the characters all straight. <laughs> um, I don't even know if that would do it for me. I mean, to be honest, you guys are laughing, but that's exactly right. The reason why... This movie, did, I missed everything, was because there was no connection to one mm -hmm. character in that movie. I could not glob on to one character. There just mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. there wasn't one character. So it's fine. I don't need a movie that connects to me. I'm I'm not that important of a person. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would add one person that I could connect to if I'm being selfish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. Uh, I say this all the time, but I can never quite think of anything. You don't have to. Yeah. If you, if you like it the way that it is, we can leave it. <laughs> I really, I can't. Not right now. I might think of something later on, but I can't. So, yeah, this movie is uh, is is precious to me. It's a beautiful piece of origami. And um, I wouldn't want to uh, start peeling back any of the wings of the swan because it would all fall apart. So I'll just I'll, I'll leave it as is for the rewrites. But I do have some standouts. Uh, so hopefully both of you guys do as well. Amy, dig deep if you can. <laughs> oh, I have an answer. My answer to a standout moment was recording this with the both of you. 
Um, truly. And, and listeners, if you are like me and like, just don't understand this movie, you are still, if you've made it this far, you're listening to the podcast and I feel like you are having your eyes opened. I don't know if I could recommend you go in and watch the movie. I would hope that you would, but it's going to be fine if you don't, because I feel (laughs) the movie you have captured the important moments and the importance to you as a person and the importance to us as a society. So I feel the best part of this movie is this discussion. So thank you both, both for opening my eyes and not letting me miss this movie. We love Love you. Um, I think for me, standouts, obviously River Phoenix was amazing. Uh, Rest of soul. I have to say... Because because I'm a huge huge fan of the Matrix, I don't know if anybody knows that by now, but watching Keanu in this movie, I think this is just different from anything that I've seen him do, uh, and at such a young age, there's just so much play and so much joy that it was just it was nice to watch him let loose in a different kind of way, and I enjoyed watching Keanu. I just enjoyed watching him do something different and really just play and just have fun. There's a there's a scene which I'm sure is it must be out of one of the Henrys, but he's messing. Uh, Keanu Reeves' character is, is messing with um, with Bob, and he grabs him and he's like picks him up and he's like shakes him and twirls him around. And I don't know. I was I was watching it. I was like, yes, there's the joy. There's the joy in the work. That's it. It, it was just, it was nice to see. It was nice to see him in that way. I've never seen him that way before. So that's my, my standout. Oh, also I have to say, um, the way that the, that the sex was handled. Like, I mean, you can, you can handle it in, you know, in filmmaking many different ways. You can have, like, you know, just flat-out sex on screen. You can do close-ups of, you know, of hands. Uh, the way that it was handled in this movie, it was, like, still shots mm. of, positions and fetishes and you know just it was a very interesting way to handle it and it kind of lets you fill in the blank of what happened in between but at the same time you know what happened and i'll be honest when i i saw i saw how it was handled with uh the sex between the two male characters and then when we got to the scene between uh keanu reeves and his love interest his other love interest i should say what was the name of the of that character, uh, the Italian character? I don't even remember what her name was. I was always looking at her like this bitch. <laughs> he should be with River. <laughs> yes, but uh, when you know when we got towards the end of the movie and we were you know they were about to to have sex, I was you know watching like they were kissing whatever else. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this movie was made in like '91, you know, in '92. We're going to see all the sex all over the place. Of course, they're going to let them have a whole scene. But it was handled the same way. It was just still shots of just different positions, bodies in different places. It was very different, and I love... I don't know, I liked that. That was a different take on it. Oh, one last thing that I have to say, and then I'll stop. The way that the characters were introduced, I thought was very clever, and not something that I, I see in film a lot. I mean, we've got, like, for example, we have the definition of a narcolepsy at the very beginning of the movie. And then, you know, I remember watching it going, okay, that's going to play into this somehow. And then, obviously, with River Phoenix, that's, like, one of his character's core identifiers is is this narcolepsy, these episodes that he has. We have, there's one uh, scene where we're in, I don't know if it was a bodega, but, you know, it's, like, the close-ups of the, the magazines, and we have the different you know, male prostitutes in each of the magazines talking to each other. I thought that was a great introduction. Like, everyone's got a different way of being introduced instead of it just being a simple one-liner scene. I mean, and that's fine, too, sometimes, depending on the piece. But it was a, a very clever way to introduce everybody. Very different, and I really appreciated that. Okay, I'm done. I want to tack on trivia to your your first standout, uh, and, and that is the... Um, I guess the way that the sex scene was handled, especially you know towards the end of the film between the Italian woman and them, and uh, Keanu Reeves' character, the scene took five hours. They shot in that that 
the house essentially and it was freezing cold outside and so the actors were miserable and it felt like they were dying essentially so they couldn't wait for it to be over but i couldn't imagine just like okay now pose this way now pose that way and it's they're naked in this freezing yeah. cold outside so kudos to them did i do a stand i haven't done my standouts oh so me my standout i'm gonna pick an odd one because we haven't discussed it yet but the soundtrack there are some musicians in this soundtrack uh, the one in particular, actually, that comes to mind, and it's like a like cowboy song, the Eddie Arnold cattle call. Mm. You know, anyway, that song sparks joy. It's a weird, oddball cowboy Western song, but it makes me smile. And from the first time I heard it, I, I love that song. And I have it on like a couple of playlists that I, that I listen to to this day. Uh, when I'm feeling like sad in that rock bottom, if I feel like I've hit rock bottom, I put that on and I think about this film, I think about those characters, it brings me back. And then all of a sudden I start feeling a little bit better. So there's, there's certain stuff like the Pogues. Uh, there's a song that closes the film by the Pogues um, right after Bob dies. And it was the first time I'd ever heard them. And uh, the lead singer, he passed away this year anyway. Uh, extra trivia. But uh, I loved that that song was sort of what they were playing out. And if you listen to the lyrics of the song, it's this joyful, rambunctious song about this, I guess it's this road in Dublin uh, where there's like whores and like liquor and all this stuff. And he's singing about it, but in this fun way and it also makes me smile so there's there's different elements of the soundtrack that to this day continue to spark joy for me and um and so yeah i just want to highlight that good soundtrack moving on to the trivia portion it's a combination of three stories including one based on shakespeare uh van Zant had three ideas rolling around his, in his head that he smushed into one movie one was a screenplay about street kids in portland and was based on William Shakespeare's Henry IV. Much of the Keanu Reeves character's story comes from this part, complete with occasional bard-like dialogue and the Falstaff-like character of Bob Pigeon. Another source uh, to which Van Zandt had already given the title, My Own Private Idaho, was another screenplay about street hustlers, one older and one younger, who traveled to Spain looking for one's mother. The third element was a short story Van Zandt wrote called in a blue funk about the river phoenix character being picked up by a german man and kept in a house hmm. no those are three stories all smushed up together <laughs> <laughs> amy's like it now makes yes, sense to now me. <laughs> i understand <laughs> Well, we have Mike's vision of Scott cradling him at the foot of the monument called The Coming of the White Man. Take some creative liberties. First of all, while Portland does have a monument by that name, the real one doesn't look like that. The stag statue is somewhere else in Portland, and it's only the stag. The rider we see in the movie is not a statue, but a crew member in makeup interesting so the guy holding yeah. the spear is just a dude painted up to look bronze aged bronze okay so i had told you guys a while back in the group chat we have a little group chat i used to live in seattle i've been to seattle portland you know a bunch of times i made it a point when i was in portland to go to all 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 of the filming locations around portland of my own private oh, wow. home that's a commitment. And I wanted to, yes. Oh, I spent a day. I, again, I was broke. I had nothing to do. I was, That's I was, fair. You know, I was like, all right, I don't know anyone. I was like, this is something, this is going to be my quest. And I got to the statue of what is essentially just a deer with some horns, which is where I looked so weird. I remember the day. It was a sunny spring day. And the parks were full of people, children, you know, kids playing hacky sack, whatever. I mean, it was a very busy day. 
And this is, I think, near the waterfront-ish. Uh, and there I go. I just flop over on the, on the thing as though I was River Phoenix's oh, character. Oh, jeez. And I didn't, I didn't have a friend there to hold the camera. So then laying there, trying to look lifeless, I tried to make a selfie of myself. <laughs> uh, and so I have it somewhere. I have to dig that out. But uh, I did, there's definitely a photo of me flopped over in front of that deer pretending to be River Phoenix. You've got to... Okay, so when we release this, you have to include that. you got to find that and include that. i, I got to find that photo. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, we did discuss this earlier. Uh, one key scene was written almost entirely by River Phoenix, the campfire scene. Uh, the way that Van Sant wrote it, uh, the scene where Mike and Scott were on the campfire in the desert, uh, where Mike confesses his love for Scott, was a three-page scene with no such de declaration. Van Sant was uh, leaving it ambiguous whether either of the hustlers was actually gay. But according to Van Sant, uh, Phoenix really wanted to beef up the impact of the scene. He had decided that the scene was this character's main scene. And with Keanu's permission, he wrote it out to say something that he wasn't already saying. It was his explanation of his character. Now the film became, at least in part, about unrequited love and adding another tragic element to it. That was a great instinct. And, you know, kudos to Vincent for being um, collaborative, especially in mm -hmm. Hollywood, uh, and letting it just really be an art piece and not just, this is it, I'm the director, go which does happen sometimes, but I appreciate that it was a collaborative piece. And, you know, it obviously, it was, it worked. It was great. So much of the cast lived at Van Sant's house during the shoot. So Van Sant had just bought a house in Portland, West Hills, and he invited Phoenix to stay there instead of a hotel. I mean, it makes sense. So Reeves and others soon joined and the place became an almost nonstop party house with jam sessions every night because Red Hot Chili Peppers Flea was a cast member after all. He and Reeves played bass while Phoenix played a guitar he picked up at the Portland music shop. It got to be such a party, in fact, that Vincent moved out of his own house and stayed in an apartment downtown. <laughs> that's cool, but you know what? That's cast building. That's like that's like that's the work that you do outside of uh, outside of your rehearsals. You have mm -hmm. parties with the cast. You get used to each other. I mean, I feel bad for Van Zant because he was probably like, "Oh, these young kids, I can't." Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what he gets. <laughs> okay, Udo Kier's cabaret act was incorporated into the film. Hans, the odd German man with intense blue eyes, who cavorts with Mike and Scott, was played by Udo Kier, a veteran actor who had about 60 movie credits under his belt then and has added another 60 since. Early in his career, Keir had a cabaret act, an amusing contradiction to his filmography, which has consisted mostly of serious, sinister types. Fascinated by this side of Keir, Van Zant had him work part of his act into my own private Idaho, resulting in the odd moment with a lamp scene. Van Zant said... Here originally used a blue flashlight. They changed it to a lamp to avoid comparison to blue velvet. Udu Kier is fantastic. I love him. I have seen him in multiple films. I think he was in a vampire film within the last couple of years. That was uh, he was in Blade. Um, he, he was, was in, in Blade the first as well. Blade. Wow. Oh my god! Of course he was. Oh my god! But he's popping up, and I sent Amy a trailer. He was in a movie recently called Swan Song, where. He played um, an aging drag queen uh, whose all of his friends have essentially passed mm. away. The gay bar he used to frequent has been, you know, changed hands. He doesn't recognize anybody anymore. And he uh, is living in essentially an old age home and then leaves there. He escapes to go and revisit his past and meet up with, you know, what friends are, are still alive. But it's a really cool movie. And it brought me so much joy to see him in another, like, queer film. I just, I loved that. Because, yeah, again, his career has been littered with, you know, nefarious characters and sinister characters and, and this kind of thing. But uh, he also does these 
these joyful pieces as well. And, and so they're worth checking out. So if you haven't seen Swan Song with Udu here, please check it out. This film has some documentary elements. Uh, those brief snips where anonymous Portland street kids talk about their experiences aren't just meant to look like a documentary. They are. Van Sant knew some of the local street kids and had them on set as advisors and extras. During the launch, uh, lunch break one day, Van Sant turned the camera on these guys and interviewed them, hoping to inspire the cast with some authenticity. The result was so intriguing that he put some of that footage into the film. That was powerful. Well, the real Street Hustler Mike is based on almost played Mike. In the early stages of development, when Mansant was still thinking as inexpensively as possible, he envisioned using non-actors to play the lead roles. That mm. includes Mike Parker, the real Portland street kid on whom Van Sant had based the Mike character. Parker wasn't narcoleptic, though another friend of Van Sant's was. When professional actors got involved, Parker was relegated to the ensemble. He plays a hustler named Digger, but he continued to help Phoenix research the role and understand the character. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, um, Spike Lee has done that a couple of times as well. Hmm. I think that he he did it with a play with uh, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson did a solo show at the Pantages Theater in Los Angeles uh, where he was just documenting things about his life. And Mike Tyson was, it was his piece, so he was, he was performing it. And I think he's done it in terms of Spike Lee has cast actual people in those actual roles in some of his other movies can't think of the, the names right now but I, I know it's been it's been done before it's pretty interesting all right the actor who plays bob pigeon was manipulated into it william reichert was a writer and director who made a night in the life of jimmy reardon in which phoenix played the title character for some reason phoenix became fixated on the idea of reichert playing Bob Pigeon in My Own Private Idaho. Even though Reichert was not an actor, Reichert was offended by the suggestion, telling Phoenix, it's a big fat pederast. Is this what you think of me? Is this what you think I should be playing? Phoenix kept trying to convince him, going so far as to bring Van Zant to Reichert's house for a reading of the screenplay. Still, he resisted. Finally, Phoenix called Reichert from the set in Portland and said, the actor who'd been hired to play Bob Pigeon had been let go. They had to shoot his scenes tomorrow. Could Rickert fly up and take the part? Worn down, Rickert finally relented. And thank goodness he oh, did because he was great. He, he was it. great. Well, we had discussed a little bit about the magazine covers. Uh, so there is a little bit of trivia here about that. The talking magazine covers were shot in a very low tech way. To achieve the effect of magazine cover boys on the newsstand coming to life and talking to each other, Van Sant went old school, very old school. Uh, he had the magazine covers mocked up on large panels of plexiglass and then had the actors stand behind them. Each one was shot separately in post-production. They were stitched together to make it look like a magazine rack. So how cool is that? That technique aged so well. It looks good, and it's so simple. It aged really well. No CGI. I loved it. The image of the falling barn was something Van Sant used to paint for years. He said it represented leaving home and knowing you're never able to return. The imagery of that, of the whole movie, and like when these images would come in, again, was very disoriented. And you're like, what is going on? So you had this house dropping. <laughs> you had swimming, uh, salmon swimming upstream. And the guy dancing with the lampshade. Was that real or was that just an image like a house falling? I didn't know. No, that was that. real. Was he on drugs? Like, is I mean, like, is it real? Like in <laughs> life? Or is this just a, a, yeah. what we're imagining? No, it was real in life. And, and, and the point where like the director put it in there because Udo Kier, the actor, had actually done that. 
It was actually part of his stage performance. He had done that with a flashlight. You can find it on YouTube. Listeners, look up Udu Kier, what, Sitting on a Bullet, I think is the... Yeah, I think that's the name of it. But anyway, check it out. It's hilarious, but also kind of weird. That is cool. wild. I have to look it up. That is so wild. I love this trivia. Uh, River Phoenix, because River Phoenix's agent refused to show him the film treatment for My Own Private Idaho in late 1990, Keanu Reeves rode his motorcycle from Canada to Phoenix's hometown of Gainesville, Florida to hand deliver the movie to him himself so he could watch it. So cool. What a good friend. Uh, filmmaker and critic Todd Haynes told Gus Van Zandt in an interview for the Criterion Collection that the campfire scene was critical to the film's success. Before the scene, it's almost like the kids are all victims of homosexuality. There's the scene where they all sit around telling their stories of being raped and abused. It's not until River Phoenix and Keanu Reeves sit around the campfire that you see one of the hustlers being gay in an all-natural environment with no money changing hands. Yeah. I mean, again, just, you know, letting people just be seen as they are. I think this, yeah, just powerful. River Phoenix was a big fan of The Simpsons and suggested its inclusion. So Simpsons creator Matt Gronig is from Portland. And in fact, Van Sant was living in what used to be his fr best friend's house. Matt let them use the footage from Treehouse of Horror for free. So a lot of the trivia for this, uh, I actually kind of knew because I, I have the Criterion Collection uh, DVD box set, which is amazing. Uh, and I wish they would release it digitally because the special features are amazing. But anyway, uh, this one bit of trivia I did not know and I thought was cute as hell. So the film's title was taken from the B-52 song, Private Idaho. Released in 1980. The tune is not used in the movie, however. And I've also never heard the song. Uh, but I get a listen now. I'm kind of curious. The campfire scene was the last scene filmed at the insistence of River Phoenix. I love that, too. They, you know, they shot all of the scenes, the principal photography of the movie, to just about finished. And on the last day, him and his buddy get together alone on the soundstage. And they just put together this masterpiece. Well, guys, uh, we have reached the final thoughts portion. Uh, and this week, I thought it appropriate. We're not here to kink shame. Uh, so we are Never going to, to give shame. out. Never. We are here to give out one to five blowjobs. All right. Well, I will go first. Um, I'm sure from the beginning of this episode, you know, I'm not a fan of the movie. And I was teasing with Mark that I would give zero blowjobs uh, for this movie. However, after this amazing discussion that has revealed this movie to have so much more meaning and so much more importance to your personal lives, therefore it is important to me, um, I will give this. Yeah, one and a half BJs, just for my love of you guys. Bless you, Amy. Bless you and your one and a half <laughs> blowjobs. <laughs> I don't know, is half a blowjob even possible? Oh, wait, yes, it is. So um, I, I, give this, uh, I give this one five BJs for sure. Definitely. Definitely. I enjoyed it very much. Oh, Matt Jennings, my buddy. Awesome. I'm so, so glad uh, you enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't say enough uh, good things about this movie. I definitely give this uh, five deep-throated, sloppy, wet blowjobs. Uh, this, is, this is one of my all-time favorite films. Yeah, it was one of, those, one of those films. Like, there's a few films that I watched when I was really young that I started realizing the art you know, films could be art and it was more than just a linear plot or uh, an action adventure piece or what have you that they could say a lot more, you know, like a, a modern work of art or something, you know, and um, and they could in that way as an art piece speak to me in my heart. And, uh, and this film did that. This is one of those pieces. And um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Matt, you enjoyed it. I'm glad that Amy, you watched it um, and that uh, enjoyed the discussion. 
So, Amy, uh, what do we have going on on the network? What shows are on BQN, you ask? Well, here's a rundown of some podcasts you might be interested in. All Good Things, a Star Trek Universe podcast covering all of Trek, hosted by Amy, Mark, Christos, Kelvin, and Kristen. Whether you've got Xbox or Nintendo, check out Bargain Bin Gamer, a YouTube show hosted by Davey, a self-proclaimed gamer who specializes in reviewing and showcasing affordable video games. Two episodes enter the arena, one comes out victorious. Join hosts Joe and Kevin, and a guest, as they debate which should win the Batleth battle. Grab your popcorn as you listen to Cinema Z, a film discussion and review podcast showcasing films you probably missed, but should definitely check out. Hosted by Mark and Matt. Don your apron for The Food Replicator, where Matthew eats and drinks his way through the Star Trek cocktail and three cookbooks. Beam Aboard Galaxy Class, a Star Trek Next Generation podcast covering all of TNG, hosted by Steven. In order to not repeat it, listen to History with the Zalogis, a snippet of historical events from around the world, hosted by Chrissy and Jason. For the newest Trek coverage, check out Infinite Diversity, hosted by Chrissy and Thad. Curl up with a good book and delve into Beta Canon with Peter, host of the online Trek Book Club on Twitter and his new companion Trek Book Club podcast. Test your Trek knowledge with Trexpert's Quiz, a Star Trek quiz show hosted and written by Davey. Whether you're a member of Starfleet Federation or Planetary Union, Go check out Union Federation, covering current Star Trek and the Orville, which we all know is really a Trek show, hosted by Kyle, Kevin, Amy, and Haley. Head over to YouTube and watch The View Screen live on Sundays, your Trek-inspired talk show hosted by Kelvin and Amy, with Season 2 starting in September for a 10-week run. Spill the tea with Christos while he discusses current Trek news and events and explores the world of fandom via guest interviews, all with a LGBTQIA plus perspective on what's the tea about. And for our Patreon members, we have the Hive Mind with monthly script readings. Let's fly a Discovery Reaction Show. It's green, a cornucopia of topics. Amy's Math Moments, a quick look at math moments in Star Trek. We know you have a choice of podcasts to choose from, and we thank you for listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. All right, listeners, um, before we jump into the rest of it, I would be remiss if I do not mention the Trevor Project. Uh, The Trevor Project uh, offers 24-7, 365 crisis services, advocacy, peer support, public education, and research programs, helping to ensure that all LGBTQI plus young people have supportive adults in their lives. For questions about giving or website, you know, related things, uh, please contact the uh, development at the trevorproject.org or you could call 212-695-8650 to reach the Trevor Project. I suggest donating. They are a very worthy cause and uh, they definitely help uh, LGBTQI plus individuals that are in need and struggling and don't have um, maybe the family support that they deserve. Matt, what the heck are we gonna be talking about next week? I don't know this thing. What is it? So next week, we are going to be talking about uh, one of my favorite queer movies called Get Real. Uh, I think it was released in the UK in 1998, and I think it had a US release in 1999. So Steven spends his high school days longing for all-star athlete 
John. But John has a gorgeous girlfriend, and Stephen's still in the closet about being gay. The only one who knows uh, the teenager's secret is his friend, Linda. I love Linda so much in this movie. Linda's great in this movie. After a curious run-in with John in a public restroom, Stephen starts to wonder if the jock is straight after all. When they start a romance, it threatens to expose the truth about both of them. The film was released in... 1998 in the UK and in 1999 in the US. Uh, it was directed by Simon Shore, who adapted it from the play What's Wrong with Angry? And we'll be discussing that next, and I'm very excited. I haven't seen that movie in 20 years. It's been a very long time. So I'm very excited to revisit it. I know I've seen the cover. It was in it was in the yeah. blockbuster. I've seen the cover. I don't know if I rented it or not. To be full transparency, I may or may not have indulged in uh, medicinal uh, marijuana at that time in my life. Um, so maybe I watched it, maybe I didn't, it. but I will be able to tell you. <laughs> I will let you know. Amy, you watched it? I'm sure Amy watched it. Yeah. No, <laughs> have not seen it. You guys were talking about Broke Map Mountain, and I still haven't seen that. So. <laughs> oh, what are you doing with your life? Why aren't you watching more queer films, Amy? <laughs> Educate uh, yourself. I know. That's why I listen to Cinema Z. <laughs> Best answer. Best from our associate <laughs> producer. <laughs> well, we would absolutely love to hear what you thought of today's episode and hope you'll join our Facebook group, That BQN Collective, to continue the discussion there. You can also send your thoughts to at Cinema Z Pod on Twitter and Blue Sky and let us know if you'd like to recommend a film. Please follow the network on Twitter, Blue Sky, and Instagram at BQN Podcast. And <clears throat> don't forget, you can join the conversation with BQN hosts and fellow fans on our Discord server. Uh, you can find an invite link in the episode description, or any one of us can send it to you in the collective. Just send us a message. We'll give it to you. It changes all the time. Okay. So, Matt. Where can people find you when uh, you are not dressed up like the little Dutch boy and going around and cleaning apartments? So you can find me. I, I, I don't know where else you would find me. No, I'm only kidding. If you get my close friends on Instagram, maybe you'll find me there. No, um, you can find me at 1701 B L E R D and at M L J E N N. Uh, if you follow my 1701 B L E R D page on Instagram, um, I have a web series. It's about a gay black nerd that uses Star Trek to cope with life. Episodes 1, 2, and 3 are out now. The web series is out. So please click on the link in the bio, watch them. It's fun. It's gay. I think it's funny. I hope you think it's funny. So please give it a watch. Uh, so, Amy, where can people find you when you are not pulling up to the side of the bodega looking for some nice 20-year-old man trade? Okay, that is just so wrong on so many levels. Um, <laughs> so you can find me here in the network where I am co-hosting All Good Things with Mark. I am also recording my thoughts on uh, Discovery, on Union Federation. I am definitely enjoying the Discord, Discord server, so find me there, Amy Nelson 522 and mark when you're not falling asleep in the middle of the road where can people find you it's like i know i've been down this road before you know where you are by the road that you are on it's it's like a face like a fucked up face anyway uh when i'm not doing that uh, you can find me on the BQN Collective uh, Facebook group. Uh, I'm sometimes on the Discord thingy. Uh, I'm sometimes on All Good Things. Yeah, there you go. Both places. Are you not on Blue Sky anymore? Oh, I'm still on Blue Sky. Oh, Blue Sky! Find me on Blue yeah, Sky! Yeah, but are you on there? It doesn't seem like you... 
at, at MW207. Listen, I have a house. Amy, I'm nowhere exactly. and everywhere. He's, I'm he's in repainting now. bathrooms. He's adding porches. He's being so masked. So masked. Oh, I know. Planting so trees. Wearing flannel. Okay. Hey, please hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your goddamn podcast. Leave us a star rating and written review because that helps others to find the show. You can also follow the entire network's wonderful podcast with our master feed by searching BQN. At this time, we would like to thank our associate producer, Amy Nelson. Amy Nelson! A special thanks to Laz Marquez for our original show artwork. The opening and closing music for this podcast is titled Dancing Dead and was provided by Ketza from the Free Music Archive, providing royalty-free music for content creators. If you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. We'll add you to the hive mind. Uh, that we are doing like monthly roundtables, script reads, just having a fun, good old time there. There's Amy's math moment. There's It's Green. Lots of network perks going on. So go find us there over at uh, patreon.com slash BQN. Now listen, if you're not wanting to give us money, I totally understand. But do you know what you can do to support the show? Talk about us. Go ahead. Do you see that little uploading that says copy link? Share that to your friends. That totally supports us and keeps us coming to you. Thank you for listening. We hope you'll tune in next time. Watch for dropping houses. <laughs> okay. Uh, flailing fish. Dropping houses. Flailing fish. Please. <laughs>But I yeah. think that that's kind of the the element, and I think that you know Mike. Wait, does it get the name right? The other the other character, um, um, Scott and Scott Mike. and Mike, um, and Bob. I think, you know, I think that's. And then there was Flea, and I don't remember what Flea's name was, but <laughs> Flea was in the movie. <laughs> you just need that one friend to be like, "I accept you. I love you. Maybe we don't feel the same way, right. but I still love you." And he doesn't reject him. It's what Amy was saying. It's like that doesn't happen enough. Right. No. It happens especially for the queer community. So many people that, you know, if you grow up in, you know, East Texas or northern Maine or like somewhere where there's not other queer people and you you know, it, Matt, you said that you had had similar experiences in your life where you were interested in somebody and they just they weren't, you know, in the family. Yeah. Um, and it's like, or like they just, they weren't ready to admit it to themselves. And they came mm -hmm. out later on, which is a whole other yeah. story. But, um, <laughs> you know, um, 